Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to our first uh, lecture in our underwater, our underwater Heritage series. My name is Nathan Richards. I'm the program head at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute's Maritime Heritage Program. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the series, actually. This is the first uh, in our nine lecture series uh, that'll run the entirety of the year with the exception of the summer. Um, it's a collaboration between the UNC Coastal Studies Institute the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum, which is part of the North Carolina Maritime Museum system, and the Outer Banks Community Foundation. Um, and I'd actually specifically like to thank the Outer Banks Community Foundation for providing us some financial support for, uh, to, uh, to be able to get people out to present uh, during, this, during this series. Um, the subject of tonight's lecture is, uh, is battlefield archaeology. Um, for a long time, the scholars at East Carolina University's Program in Maritime Studies, uh, in particular Dr. Larry Babbitts, has been, uh, have been innovators in looking at maritime battlefields. And so for a number of years we've been looking at a series of different types of battlefields, um, starting off with World War II battlefields, convoy battles, um, as part of a collaborative program with Monitor, the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. And from those examinations, uh, looking at different theoretical points of view on how to read battlefields, we've sort of start to look, we've started to look at Civil War battlefields. And so we've had quite a few students studying battlefield archaeology in a maritime context. And so that's the subject for tonight. One of the a graduate student from the program in Maritime Studies, Adam Parker, all the way from Flint, Michigan, <laughs> of all places, uh, is going to uh, look at the Battle of Elizabeth City. So um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to, to uh, Adam Parker. Thank you. Well, thank you first for every, everyone for coming tonight. Uh, as uh, Dr. Richards said, my name is Adam Parker. And I just want to give you a, uh, kind of a brief outline on how I even got interested in this battle. Uh, I stopped into Nathan the very first day of class, my very first semester of grad school. And uh, we were talking about different uh, projects that he was thinking about starting up with students. And he listed off a couple of them. Uh, the Battle of Roanoke Island was another one that he listed off to me. And I went home for a couple days, and I re did some preliminary research on all the top, all the battles that he'd mentioned. And the Battle of Elizabeth City really stuck out to me because of all the different components to it. Uh, the steamers, uh, there was a sailing schooner, and there was also a land component with the fort, and so it was just a really cool little battle to me to begin with, and so that's why I ended up looking at this battle in particular. For those of you who don't know about Elizabeth City, it's uh, at the headwaters of the Pascotank River and the southern terminus of the Dismal Swamp Canal, and as you can see, it's very close to the Virginia line. And the Dismal Swamp Canal connected uh, Elizabeth City to the larger port of Norfolk. Otherwise, the main ocean going inlet in the Outer Banks was Hatteras Inlet, which is much further to the south in Pamlico Sound. And so Elizabeth City really brought uh, Elb uh, northeastern North Carolina and Albemarle Sound to an easier port for trade and for facilitating other goods. Uh, currently, it is the county seat of Pasquotank County. And by the 1860s, it had surpassed Edenton as the main river port in Albemarle Sound. Also nearby is the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal, which was built in the 1850s. And the Albemarle and Chesapeake Canal was important going up into the Civil War, but during the Civil War, after the Battle of Elizabeth City, it was blocked. And so the Dismal Swamp Canal became the main uh, canal connecting northeastern North Carolina to Norfolk and the rest of Virginia. So why would we even look at the archaeology of war and battlefields? Well, warfare is one of the most organized and patterned forms of human behavior. Anything that happens on a battlefield is not a random action. If you look at how 
a military or an army is organized, it, each unit has its own function and it's normally uh, uh, subordinate to another unit and so on and so forth. And those units have to uh, act in a very cohesive fashion to even start uh, working in a battle formation. And secondly, it's not the actual field where the battle happened that is being examined. It's the event of the battle itself. It's what happened during the battle that archaeologists look at. Many historical, most of the historical sources we look at, they have a bias towards them, and not a bias in a bad way. A bias in that they are a single perspective, and if you have a hundred different perspectives of one battle, you're going to get a hundred different types of answers to questions. Well, those an question, um, those answers come in the form of where, what, who, and how, but it really doesn't answer the question of why. Why did a commander make the certain decisions that he made on the battlefield? Why did certain other things happen? And so that's what the archaeologists are really trying to answer is the question of why. Why did these things happen? And this archaeology also extends itself into soldiers camps or POW camps or even uh, civilian lives during uh, civil unrest. So how do we look at battlefields? That's one of the big questions. Uh, the American Battlefield Protection Program, which is part of the National Park Service, is the main grant funding agency for looking at battlefields in the United States. One thing is that they only do look at uh, battles that happen on American soil or involve American forces. So you won't see any reports for them on English battles or anything like that. But they started a standardized methodology called COCOA. And COCOA is a methodology that really opens up the terrain of a battlefield so that archaeologists and other researchers can start looking at the battlefield through a soldier's eyes. What do I mean by that? They begin seeing the battlefield in a way that a soldier would and how a battlefield would be advantageous. What aspects of the terrain would help him advance towards the enemy and conquer the enemy? or if he was retreating, what was going to give him the most protection? Now, COCOA is an acronym, and the first term of it is Key Terrain. Now, this is ground which offers either an advantage or denies the enemy an advantage by occupying it. And by occupying it, it might not offer your army a certain advantage, but by denying the enemy that advantage, you're uh, making steps to for the success of your operation. A very big key point in this is uh, high ground and occupying the high ground. An enemy who is coming at an army from uh, an area of low ground is going to have a much harder time fighting as they advance uh, up a hill. Uh, one of the big studies that we see uh, happened with the landing beaches at and Saipan during World War II. And this photo shows how the mountains were one of the big aspects of the Japanese uh, entrenchments and how they dug into the mountains before the Americans landed on the beaches down here, thus giving the Japanese the high ground. The obstacle is terrain which restricts troop movement. And this can be also include high ground f uh, for uh, advancing armies trying to push in up into that high ground. Or in the case of Saipan, you see these reef systems up here, which dictated how the Americans could actually land on the beachhead. Cover and concealment are two terms that really go hand in hand. Cover is uh, terrain which would actually offer protection or a feature on the landscape that would offer protection from enemy fire, but it might not necessarily hide you. Concealment, on the other hand, would actually hide you, whereas it wouldn't protect you from enemy fire. So a stone wall is a really good example of something that pr would provide cover. 
uh, a lot of these battles that Kakoa has been used on are Civil War and Revolutionary War battles. And so the stone walls we're talking about are about waist high. They can provide cover and protection from enemy fire if you're able to uh, duck beneath them, but most likely the enemy is still going to be able to see you. A forest, on the other hand, is going to be able to conceal a lot of your movements from the enemy, but because trees are not walls, they are not going to stop the bullets nearly as effectively. A ridge line from a high ground position also does the same thing, where you might be able to uh, stop, you might be able to remain concealed from the enemy fire, but if they have heavy artillery, then they're going to be able to bombard your position. Observations and fields of fire. Observations are being able to observe the enemy mo enemy's movements without being observed yourself. Fields of fire are looking at what capabilities each weapon that is at your disposal is going to get, uh, give you. In the case, and in this case, this is actually a simplified version of one of the things that we're going to look at later tonight. This is a couple of the ranges of the Confederate guns as the Union formation approached their position at Fort Cobb. And so you can see how, oh, that's not what I wanted. You can see the different range aspects that each ship and fort gun would have had as they uh, fired on the Union fleet. This thing is tricky. Avenues of approach and retreat are really connected a lot with transportation systems, but they also are uh, uh, con connected with natural terrain features as well. What we see in Saipan is that the reef systems actually dictated how the Americans were going to move on the beachhead and where they could actually move. Once the Americans pushed onto the island, then they could utilize the road features on the island to reinforce their fronts, or the uh, Japanese also may have been able to use these same uh, road ra transportation systems to be able to either retreat or reinforce their fronts as well. There's a lot of problems with looking at naval battles from that aspect, though, and a lot of the key terms have to be redefined. Key terrain in an open ocean battle is uh, non-existent. There's no high ground. It's a flat plane. It's a flat surface that you're fighting on. Similarly, avenues of approach and retreat, it's wherever your boat can go and however much draft you have beneath your boat or ship. And so I started looking at how naval theory and how it's significantly in at its core different from terrestrial theory, terrestrial military theory, can really be looked at and applied to naval battles in particular. And one of the first things that I discovered was that na modern naval tactics are based in maneuver warfare. What that means is that naval warfare se seeks to uh, exploit the weaknesses of the enemy. And so you might hit one of his weak spots so that he has to therefore reinforce that, taking away his resources from another spot, in which case you would redirect your forces to that new weak spot until he can no longer keep up reinforcing or resupplying his forces. This isn't a lot of opposition to what terrestrial warfare is, which is called attrition warfare, where basically it is each side going head to head in an open field in a lot of cases until they can no longer reinforce. The United States Navy officially adopted operational maneuver from the sea in 1994, and this was really uh, a way of doctrinizing uh, joint operations uh, between the Air Force, Marine Corps, and the Navy. But the Maneuver aspect had been in place in the Navy for over a hundred years. It was already conventional wisdom. So maneuver from the sea is based on four key points. And the first is center of gravity. 
And this is the single element that allows your enemy to continue fighting. The next term is critical vulnerability. Critical vulnerability is the thing that's going to allow you to that's going to allow for exploitation that's going to allow you to actually destroy that center of gravity. Focus of effort is the objective and how you aim to exploit that critical vulnerability to destroy that uh, center of gravity. And finally, the main effort is the unit that's in charge of uh, dictating how the battle is going to be fought. It's going to be the unit that actually conducts the focus of effort. And the main effort can be changed mid-battle by the commanding officer if deemed so. A really easy way of looking at this is a simple amphibious assault. Say your enemy has a fortified position. That position is going to need a supply route. The fortified position becomes the center of gravity, and the supply route becomes the center, uh, the critical vulnerability. The focus of effort would be an amphibious assault on it. And so the main effort at the beginning would be a bombardment of both the uh, fortification and the supply route by ships while troops landed. At that point, the main effort could be uh, changed to the troops as they uh, secure the supply route and destroy the fortification. So why look at the Battle of Elizabeth City? First, it was fleet-on-fleet -fleet action. There was no amphibious uh, operation to it, which makes it perfect for examining exactly how navies would have fought each other without the added complication of looking at troops and everything like that. And secondly, this was before submarine warfare and aerial warfare really came into play. So it doesn't add a three-dimensional aspect to the battle. It's all a two-dimensional, and you can look at it on a single plane uh, as you would regiments in an army attacking each other. And it goes, it's, uh, it makes it easier to apply theory when you go from less complex to more complex. So the goal is to look at less complex battles like this before moving them up into more three-dimensional battles like a World War II battle would be. This battle also had several different types of battles, as I mentioned earlier. It had sidewheel steamers, screw propeller steamers, there was a sailing schooner, and there was a Confederate battery at Fort Cobb. These components allow for different inf inf that interpretation on how naval warfare was especially changing while, we, while the Americans were being introduced to steam technology and naval warfare, as opposed to old sailing tactics that they would have used. And the battle also has several primary documents, both official from the Navy and several civilian documents as well, uh, accompanied by several archaeological features in the form of shipwrecks. And so there's a lot of information for us to look at and then really examine this battle. So no battle happens in isolation from uh, any other battle. They're all part of a campaign or a strategic goal. <coughs> and so the beginning of the uh, uh, strategy for the uh, Union to really start pushing into northeastern North Carolina came in the form of the Burnside Expedition. No, I'm sorry. That title for the uh, slide is wrong. It first came in the uh, form of the battle at Hatteras Inlet. Hatteras Inlet was the base for a lot of Confederate privateers uh, in the early part of the uh, Civil War. And they were doing a lot of damage to Union shipping. And so all the shipping bosses in New York were really pushing the Union higher, uh, higher ups to really do something about the privateers. And so they formed an expedition to Forts Hatteras and Clark at Hatteras Inlet in August of 1861. And the main uh, objective was to take control of the inlet. 
And so after one day of really heavy shelling and a little bit on the second day, the Confederates ended up surrendering, giving the Union control of Hatteras Inlet. This was not only a strategic victory, but it was also a morale, vic morale victory for the Union. They had recently just been defeated at the Battle of the First Bull Run. And so this was the very first major Union victory of the war, and it gave a much needed boost to their morale. The original plan with Hatteras Inlet was to block it up, but some of the officers convinced uh, Lincoln and others in his cabinet not to do so, and instead used the position they had gained in order to uh, push into eastern North Carolina, which gave uh, rise to the Burnside Expedition. The first battle of the Burnside Expedition was the Battle of Roanoke Island, fought on 7th and 8th of February of 1862. It was commanded by General Burnside on the Army component and uh, Admiral Gold, uh, Lewis Goldsboro on the uh, naval component of the expedition. Uh, the Bal Roanoke Island, as many of us in this room may know, is surrounded by two different channels. Both of them are the only channels allowing for, for access to Pamlico Sound from Albemarle Sound. And therefore, it was a strategic point to really take control of, to control all of Pamlico Sound in particular. And therefore, heavy shelling con uh, commenced on February 7th and continued for the rest of the day. Union troops were landed during, throughout the day, and the next day, shelling really stopped for the most part, while the troops instead attacked from the uh, inland parts of the island to take the island completely on the 8th. It also, so the outcome was that Pamlico Sound was almost now entirely in federal hands. It also gave, gave the Union a base of operations for further pushes into eastern North Carolina. Now, the Confederate fleet that was here at Roanoke Island fighting that day ran out of ammunition and ended up retreating to Elizabeth City, which is uh, where a couple days later they met the uh, Union forces. But before we can really start talking about the historical narrative and the archaeology that me and Dr. Richards completed, we really have to look at the previous archaeology that had happened at Elizabeth City. The first is the CSS Black Warrior. It was mapped out and documented by North Carolina's Underwater Archaeology Branch in 1999 and 2000. And in 2001, a gun carriage was brought up to be preserved from the uh, wreck site. It was a centerboard schooner that was pressed into service not long before the Battle of Roanoke Island. And therefore, uh, it was really hastily put together and armed. It was ended up being burned at the uh, Battle of Elizabeth City to avoid being captured. And here's the picture of the uh, preserved uh, gun carriage, courtesy of Mr. Bruce Long. The second piece of archaeology that we see in Elizabeth City in the vicinity or associated with the battle is the wreck of the CSS Appomattox. There were two vessels that made a retreat from Elizabeth City uh, on the day of the battle, and they were CSS Beaufort and CSS Appomattox. When they reached the locks at South Mills, uh, Beaufort was able to make it through, but Appomattox was too large to fit through the locks, and therefore was sailed a little bit ways down the canal and ended up being sank. Uh, it was documented by a four-man team uh, under permit from the uh, North Carolina Underwater Archaeology Branch from 2007 to 2010, and it was positively identified actually by an engraved spoon from one of the crew members. So just a little general information about the Battle of Elizabeth City. It was fought on the morning of February 10, 1862, two days after the Confederate surrender at Roanoke Island. Uh, 
And the Confederate forces consisted of five steamers, a four-gun shore battery, and a, a sailing schooner. The Union forces consisted of 13 steamers uh, commanded by Commander Stephen Rowan, and the Confederates were commanded by Flag Officer Lynch Rowan, who has an awesome mustache, I must say. <laughs> so, coming up with how I wanted to approach my archaeological survey and what my goals for it were, were first I wanted to really pinpoint where the battle had happened using GIS modeling uh, and then going in and looking at spent ordnance to see if we could find any archaeological evidence of those spent ordnance pieces. I used a magnetic uh, modeling program called P-Block to see if there would be significant magnetic features and therefore uh, any evidence that could really narrow down where the battlefield was. And the second objective was to find the remains of CSS Seabird, which was the Confederate flagship. It was sank at the battle, ran by USS Commodore Perry, and nearly split in two. And it has to date not been found, and so I was really hoping to find uh, that wreck as well with this archaeological survey. But the GIS modeling, for those of you who don't know, Geographic Information System is a mapping software that we use in archaeology quite a bit to show where all we're going or make a lot of interpretations or really help us map out an area that we've excavated. And so I used it in order to narrow down a search area for uh, the survey. There are several steps used in creation of this. First, the landscape had to be recreated as it was in 1862. And using both historic and modern uh, sounding data, I had to create uh, bathymetry models in order to see if there was, number one, any dredging that had happened since the uh, battle that would have disturbed uh, cultural anomalies. One moment, please. A second reason for doing a historic bathymetry model was also to be able to place the, uh, uh, all the vessels in an area where they actually would have been able to float and not become grounded. And the third part of the GIS modeling was to break the battle down into distinct phases where uh, I could describe what was happening in that phase and really look how the ships were interacting with the terrain, the river, and with each other not only th in space, but also through time. And so I used a modern map as my base map from NOAA, and then two other maps from the time period to get the historic sounding data. And so the first one is from 1860. And we, I used this one first primarily because it was closer to the time period that the battle was fought, and it shows a lot more information along the <coughs> banks of the river here, and a lot more sounding data in the river itself. Whereas our 1855 map right here shows a little bit of information. Uh, the problem was that this map ended right here on the actual map, and this one allowed me to map more of the river to really look at how the approach by the Union would have been made and their avenue of approach. So this is the uh, GIS model of the landscape circa 1862. Uh, as we can see, Elizabeth City is right here. And then marshlands and woodlands really are uh, predominantly on the uh, Camden County side of the river, but there's still some along the uh, uh, Pasquotank County side. One of the problems with these maps is that they don't show any information for what's down here on either one. And so therefore, I had to basically assume that this was all cleared land in this area without any for information to tell me any differently. It was one of the assumptions I had to make. <coughs> 
but these are the bathymetric models. Uh, as we can see, in 1862, a lot of the river in the main area was either 8 to 12 feet deep, and we see the same depth, roughly the same depth in this area, which tell, told us that not a whole lot of dredging had happened that would have disturbed uh, cultural anomalies. We see the main dredging happening up near the city, where they would have been extending the, uh, or dredging out to uh, facilitate better uh, movement for the canal. This is just a closer up version of those models surrounding Cobb Point, where the uh, Confederate fort was. And so the first phase of the battle was the Confederate position. We know what their position was based on uh, midshipman Robert Cam's uh, journal and logbook, and that they were using a line of breast formation. In the line of breast formation, the fla uh, flagship of the fleet would have been located in the center of the fleet. The next superior officer would be on his starboard side, and the third superior officer would be on his port side, and so on and so forth. Black Warrior right here, was aligned uh, across the river straight from Fort Cobb right here. And so one of the reasons they did that was hopefully to catch the uh, Union vessels in a crossfire. For Fort Cobb's uh, modeling, what I had to do was I really looked at a lot of different sources, a lot of civilian sources, uh, described it as just breastworks, which were just uh, was basically just a wall uh, about chest high. And there were no sides on it. It was really vulnerable to enfilading fire, which basically means that it could be flanked easily. Uh, Colonel Henningsen of the Wise Legion, a couple days before the battle, tried uh, pressing a couple slaves into service to build up some sidewalls, but with only a couple days to actually build, they were not able to. The fort had four guns, three of which were only able to be pointed downriver, and a fourth one was mounted on a barbette mount, which means it had 180 de degrees of motion for it, but it could not, uh, and it could be fired across the river, but reports say that it could not be f fired behind the actual fort. So after, uh, if the Union vessels passed it, they were, uh, the fort was completely vulnerable at that point. Now a couple of the defenders, just very quickly. This was CSS Fanny. Actually while it was still uh, a USS vessel, it was uh, taken by Confederate forces at Chickamacomico. Uh, and then registered in the uh, Confederate Navy. We see CSS Ellis right here after it was captured later on, and then CSS Appomattox right here while it was still operating under the name Empire as a POW truce vessel. Now, this is confusing, I know. <laughs> this is why I showed you the simplified one earlier. Uh, these are all the different ranges for the uh, Confederate vessels' guns. And on the left side, we see their effective ranges. The Union, at two miles away, when we're told the uh, Confederates started firing, the Union was roughly right there. Now, that tells us that the Confederates were really using their maximum ranges to the fullest effect. And if we look at the maximum ranges of their guns, we see that there's the Union right there. And this is also kind of uh, mentioned by the historical sources in that they, the Confederates were firing as much as they could, but they could also, they also weren't firing extremely accurately. And so we know that they were extending the use of their guns as much as they could, almost in a way to dare uh, com Commander Rowan in coming further. The Union formation was probably the hardest part of the uh, GIS model to actually put together. 
Uh, Commander Rowan said that he had three columns of ships, which was hard for me to understand because I was imagining them in the classic uh, ship of the line kind of line ahead formation that you see in like Horatio Hornblower or Patrick O'Brien books. But one of my sources uh, said that they were moving up the river like a wedge, which told me it was more of a triangle kind of shape. And the placement of these ships uh, is as best as I could recreate from the historical documents and the historical record. Uh, I do want to say right now that there might be some problems with this. We know where each vessel was uh, according to Commander Rowan's orders. Outside of that, there's no really mention of where they were placed in the formation. And so I had to go back and really look at uh, the details of the battle from the Union perspective in where I should place each of these vessels. The first column was really the hardest to come up with. Ceres, we know, was on the extreme right flank of the uh, formation. Uh, it was Commander Rowan often referred to Ceres as the Little Ceres because it had such a light draft and was able to uh, probably reconter and look for really, really low spots in the river uh, without getting grounded, which would have been useful for Rowan. We know that both Underwriter and Commodore Perry both made rushes at CSS Seabird during the battle. So it made sense to me that they were probably uh, right next to each other. Although Delaware might have been where I placed Commodore Perry because as we see with the Confederate formation, it was conventional uh, naval tradition to have the uh, flagship of the column or column leader in the middle of the formation. Uh, so there might be some problems here but I think I got it fairly well. The uh, second uh, part was uh, the Whitehead and the Shawshanks position. Whitehead and Valley City were both instructed to attack the fort from the rear. And so I originally thought that Valley City and Whitehead were right next to each other. But uh, Acting Master French of the Whitehead had reported that he had stopped where Black Warrior was in order to uh, get as much as he could off of it before it uh, sank. Which told me it was probably behind Lockwood who was the first one to actually begin attacking uh, Black Warrior. And so this is how the Union would have advanced up the river. Oh. I didn't do the cool animation, Nathan. <laughs> uh, but they would have been sailing in that pattern upriver towards the Confederate positions. For the first column, these are just a couple of the uh, ships. We have Ceres right here, which is honestly probably my favorite ship from the battle. We have the flagship Delaware right here, and then Commodore Perry right here from later on in the war. In columns two and three, we have the USS Louisiana, which was the leader of column two, and then USS Hetzel, which was the uh, column leader of, number th of the third column. So phase two was dash at the enemy, where Commander Rowan finally gives his orders. They traveled from two miles out from Cobb Point to within three quarters of a mile of Cobb Point to really before they started firing. That brought them within almost the effective range of the Confederate uh, fields of fire. But by that point, the Union started firing. This was their effective range. And a lot of these front forward facing uh, ranges were a lot of howitzers. Uh, we also see that this is where the Rebel fleet was. 
Oh, some of these vessels also were armed in the traditional fashion of having broadsides. So we see that they would have had guns uh, focused more out towards the uh, flanks, and those probably weren't used. But these are the effective ranges, and when we look at the maximum ranges, we see that Commander Rowan really waited until about the last second before he really started using his guns because he wanted the Confederates to be well within range before he attacked or made any, uh, any move whatsoever. So phase three, uh, the Re Union rear guard started entering the battle. And I know that this, <coughs> these are kind of hard to read. This is the rear guard right here. We see that Beaufort, CSS Beaufort, her, whose crew had been uh, summoned on land to man the uh, fort guns after the militia had deserted. Uh, it only had a skeleton crew, and so it was uh, commanded to go upriver as soon as the fighting happened. Seabird is right here, and Underwriter is right here. Appomattox, which originally had been firing very heavily, uh, accidentally spiked its guns, and at that point had to start retreating from the battle. CSS Ellis right here starts advancing towards the fleet, and then CSS Fanny also starts approaching towards the fleet. Uh, Lockwood begins firing on uh, Black Warrior, but during, uh, while Fanny was advancing on the fleet, Commodore Perry exchanged musketry with it, as well as fired a 100-pound shot directly into the hull, which set it ablaze. Now, the Union rear guard really couldn't do a whole lot while the first two columns were dashing on the Confederate fleet because they were too, uh, all the ships were too bunched together and they didn't want to hit friendly forces. And so they had to wait uh, before they could get their turn at start starting to fire. And we start seeing their uh, assorted ranges right here. Phase four of the battle was close quarters. Uh, by this point, a couple different ships right here started ganging up on uh, CSS Fanny as it burned, uh, exchanging musketry with uh, its uh, sailors who were uh, retreating towards shore. Uh, others, other vessels started uh, really threatening the fort with their fire. Whitehead began uh, its final approach uh, to uh, Black Warrior. Ceres and CSS Ellis, uh, uh, Ceres boarded CSS Ellis and therefore uh, there was some pretty uh, intense combat going on on that vessel. And finally, Commodore Perry rams and sinks Seabird. You'll notice that a couple of these vessels haven't moved, and that's because I wasn't able to find enough documentation to really outline what they did during the battle. And so without that information, I couldn't put them in the battle space through time. But uh, as this vessel right here is Shawshin, and it was originally going to board uh, Fanny much the way that Whitehead was with uh, Black Warrior, but it was waved off by uh, Delaware. And so it uh, began pursuing the uh, retreating vessels with uh, Underwriter. And uh, one of the vessels ended up sending men over to retrieve the flag from Fanny before it completely burned and sank. And as Beaufort and Appomattox retreated, Underwriter and Appomattox were uh, exchanging howitzer fire. Uh, Underwriter from its bow and Appomattox from its stern. And these are the fields of fire for those two, uh, for those two uh, vessels. The battle's aftermath. Well, the battle ended in a complete Union victory. All, only one of the Confederate vessels made it out of the 
uh, successfully retreated from the battle. Ellis ended up being captured by Union forces. And so the Union took control of Elizabeth City and within two days, Edenton as well, which gave them almost complete control of Albemarle Sound. Secondly, the back door to Norfolk and the Dismal Swamp Canal were taken by Union forces. They ended up blocking up the Albemarle and Chesapeake so that it couldn't be used. And so the Union now really held the only way to get into uh, Norfolk and Gosport's back door. And finally, the Mosquito Fleet, North Carolina's only, oops, only defensive fleet, uh, was destroyed and was never able to mount a resistance to the uh, Union occupation again for the, time, for the rest of the war. The picture, which I think is one of the coolest <coughs> pictures I've ever seen, is uh, uh, when uh, Ceres boarded Ellis and the final stage final stages of the uh, battle. A search for Seabird. Uh, myself and my classmate Michelle Panico, accompanied by uh, boat support from Mr. Bruce Long, uh, in the middle of September, we dove on a couple of sites that were identified by a 2009 side sand survey done by Mr. Barry Collins. And the first day we dove on all but we dove on the sites that had lesser potential so we could rule them out. The uh, second day, we were supposed to dive on the site that had the biggest potential, but weather came against us as well as equipment failures, and so we had to call those dives and not find it that time. Given the conditions of the river, though, and how much we could actually see underwater, uh, it was also decided that we should actually probably have uh, a side scan, a new side scan survey, and magnetometer survey done as well, which is why I did all that nice GIS stuff. So I identified two pri priority areas for the survey. The northern uh, survey section one was the primary battlefield area, and so that was going to be where I really wanted to find not only Seabird, but a lot of pieces of uh, spent ordnance. Uh, survey Area 2, I was really curious to see if it was really two miles out that the Union was fired upon while they were making their approach, or if it was closer into the uh, uh, point. And so the available time, the available funds, and how fast we could actually go really dictated uh, how much of this was going to get done. And with the funding that we had, we could actually only focus on uh, survey area number one. Lane spacing of 40 meters was good. It gave us a lot of coverage in the two days that we surveyed. Uh, but it's not necessarily good at finding very small items like spent ordnance. We kind of had to make a balancing act of making the funding go as far as it could and still be able to find stuff. So here are pictures of the remote sensing survey. Uh, on December 8th and 9th last month, me and Dr. Richards and our hardy crew of two sailors uh, went up to Elizabeth City on two very cold days to do this. And we used CSI's uh, Klein side scan sonar and ECU's uh, magnetometer. And the data that we collected from that is still being processed right now. So I can't make a whole lot of uh, interpretations, but we're going to show you a little bit of what data we have processed. This is the uh, side scan map and the coverage that we actually had with it. I was lucky to have two very, very good boat drivers with me to get such good coverage. And these are all the different contacts that we actually had. So you see one here, one here, one here. There were over 200 contacts that we actually have identified so far. And we don't know what this is yet, 
right here, it could be a shipwreck, it could be a different kind of uh, anomaly, but, well, you put that. But here it is, and you can kind of see the outline of it right here. You can also see a little bit of an acoustic shadow, which tells us that it's sticking up out of the ground. And here's the magnetometer, uh, preliminary magnetometer data that we have. There, it needs to be tweaked a little bit. We still have a lot of processing to do with it, but preliminarily it looks really good and has some promising uh, finds in it for us. Now, some preliminary interpretations from the battle. Uh, and I want to uh, separate one preliminary uh, interpretation for the Confederates and one for the uh, Union. What we're going to look at for the Kakoa analysis is the Confederates. They really use the uh, terrain of the river to their advantage. There was a choke point basically that Cobb Point created. So by having Black Warrior and Fort Cobb fire opposite from each other, they were creating a crossfire for the Union to have to go through to even reach the point and reach the uh, Confederate fleet. And Lynch was smart in that he put all of his steamers in the river, I mean, behind, above the choke point, so that they would have more mobility and be able to block the river a lot better than if he would have had uh, Black Warrior in the formation as well, which would have been dependent on uh, winds and currents, since it was a sailing schooner. So we can start seeing how uh, the Confederates were really using the terrain as well as they could. For the Union, and looking at more not modern naval tactics, Fort Cobb became the center of gravity for the Union uh, forces. In this time, we were still, as I said earlier, we're still kind of using uh, sailing tactics, but uh, just with steam-driven vessels. And so, in the time of sail, one fort gun was worth four at sea because they were stable and they weren't reliant on winds and tides. And so Fort Cobb became uh, Lynch's strongest point. And so without Fort Cobb, he wouldn't have been able to continue the battle. There were two critical vulnerabilities, and those were Confederate morale and the Mosquito Fleet itself. Uh, having just come off the defeat at Roanoke Island, Confederate morale was low, and we see that after Rowan gives the orders to dash at the enemy, they, their morale just lowered as the Union fleet laid on full steam right ahead, firing. The Confederate mos yeah, Mosquito Fleet, uh, also because we're looking at a time period where ship guns were not, as, were not viewed as reliable, as reliable as fort guns, they themselves became the uh, uh, critical vulnerability because they would have more easily been able to be uh, overcame and exploited. And then finally, Rowan also did make two main efforts, if you really read everything. Uh, the vanguard was to eliminate the Mosquito Fleet first, while the rear guard was supposed to attack Fort Cobb from the rear. And expose its uh, ability to be flanked and uh, destroy uh, the Confederate center of gravity. And again, these are just preliminary interpretations. It's going to uh, be really interesting to start looking at this data and how the survey data from the side scan and magnetometer really uh, help us out in making these interpretations. Finally, special thanks for this uh, go to uh, UNC Coastal Studies Institute, North Carolina uh, Marine M Museums at Hatteras, East Carolina University, the Outer Banks Community Foundation, Dr. Nathan Richards, and finally my classmates, Ms. Michelle Panico, Mr. Greg Stratton, Mr. Ryan Bradley, and Elizabeth City local Mr. Bruce Long. And uh, I want to thank you all for listening, and uh, time for questions if you guys have any.